ago this week, I don't have to tell you, the World Health Organization declared COVID a pandemic. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, and in accordance with UCLA health restrictions and guidelines, the Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies has hosted all pro programs virtually since March of 2019, making this the first occasion for us to gather in person as a group. Einstein. I'm a professor in history. I hold the Viterbi Chair of Mediterranean Jewish Studies, and I'm honored to hold the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Directorship of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. Um, and it has been a pleasure all week to be in conversation with Dr. Mariana Hirsch of Columbia University, who has been in residence with our community, sharing with us her extraordinary imagination and interpretive gusto. In a talk she delivered, Yesterday, to UCLA faculty and students, uh, Professor Hirsch noted that we exist at this moment in a suspended present, haunted by these two years of COVID, now, of course, in horror at events in Ukraine, not quite back to whatever normal life shall look like in the future. So in homage to your insights, I thought it was important to open this happy occasion of reunion with a few initial somber reflections. We have, as a community, seen many losses, including beloved members of our community. And we haven't had the chance to say out loud together how much we mourn the passing of Annette Levy, Al Finsey, and Stephen Lesser, philanthropists, partners, friends, family, as well as Dr. Nancy Ezer, who both held a PhD in Hebrew literature from this institution and dedicated three decades of her life to teaching Hebrew in her, um, in her famed and wonderful fashion. May their memories be for a blessing. There have been other losses. We have witnessed the frustration, lost opportunities, and worries of our students. We have missed out on so many conversations, on so much companionship, on the very thing that holds us together as a community, the chance to engage in lively, informed, critical dialogue about Jewish culture's past, present, and future. Our staff and affiliates have at times struggled but always succeeded in carrying on the center's mission. Uh, and all of us have done the same, struggled to carry on our own <laughs> missions, our everyday lives in cramped, unusual circumstances, juggling caregiving responsibilities, and of course our own worries and uncertainty. And yet there have been so many blessings. Um, our staff, Vivian Hollenbeck, Raina Chung, Chelsea White, David Wu, and our Levy Center Student Fellow for the Year, Rebecca Glassberg, have been unbelievable, have been truly exemplary, creative, resilient, committed to our goals, even when we had to do so in remove from one another. And through our remarkably robust online programming, we have seen something extraordinary. That is that the reach of the L&D Levy Center has expanded exponentially, reaching a national and international community, collaborating with new partners around the globe, and watching as individual events reach over a thousand views each, something we really could never have thought possible under an older model. So how fitting that our first return to learning in person is in the company of Professor Hirsch, whose talk tonight, entitled Remembering Possibility, Memory and Photography in Liquid Time, applies her expertise in Holocaust studies, feminist studies, memory studies, visual studies, and trauma studies, fields she has not only helped to shape, but to put in conversation. No problem. The formidable, ah, is that better? <laughs> the formidable job of introducing a scholar so legion as uh, Mariana falls to my colleague, Professor Michael Rothberg. And so it is my job for the moment to, to welcome you to the Etta and Milton Levy Scholar in Residence Lecture and the 1939 Society Lecture in Holocaust Studies and to say how very pleased I am to gather again. Perhaps we cannot yet bring ourselves to say that we are stronger than before. I don't think so. But hopefully we will. 
And I hope that we will move forward wiser, more patient, with more empathy, and ever more curiosity. So to welcome our guest, I will turn the floor to my colleague and friend Michael Rothberg, the chair of the Department of Comparative Literature, professor of English and Comparative Literature at the 1939 Society, Samuel Goetz, uh, chair in Holocaust Studies, a most distinguished colleague who I am so proud um, to call a friend and uh, a member of our center. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for welcoming us, for your powerful words, and for that kind uh, introduction. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Rothberg, and on behalf of the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, I'd like to welcome you, or re-welcome you, to this lecture by Professor Mariana Hirsch of Columbia University. This is the marquee event of the 1939 Society Program in Holocaust Studies for the year, and I'm deep, deeply grateful to the 1939 Society and to the Levy family for all the support they give us and for the important work that they do. I'm, of course, also grateful to the staff of the Levy Center who make all our events possible. So thank you for joining us today, and uh, we ask that you please take a moment to silence your cell phone. It's, <laughs> including the speaker. It's, it's a great honor, as well as a great pleasure, to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Mariana Hirsch, who has been a mentor, colleague, and friend for many years. Mariana Hirsch is the William Peter Field Trent Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where she is also a professor in the Institute for Research on Sexuality and Gender, a unit she previously directed, as she did Columbia's Center for the Study of Social Difference. Before coming to Columbia, she taught for many years at Dartmouth College, where she was the Ted and Helen Geisel third century professor in the humanities. Mariana Hirsch's list of accomplishments is so long that I can only mention a few of the highlights. She's a past president of the Modern Language Association of America and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016. She's been a distinguished lecturer at the National Humanities Center and has held numerous prestigious fellowships, including the Guggenheim, the Berlin Prize Fellowship of the American Academy in Berlin, an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship, and, and many more. When I tried to characterize uh, Mariana Hirsch to myself as a colleague and scholar, the first two words that came to mind were generosity and generativity. Um, as a colleague, Mariana is both generous and generative. She has a long track record of supporting graduate students and junior colleagues and has left a mark on many of us in the profession. Um, her generous mentorship has generated new generations of scholars, something we've been talking about here. Mariana's scholarship is also both generous and generative. The generosity comes at least in part from a feminist ethic that values collaboration and a capacious sense of difference. The feminist side of Mariana's work is everywhere visible from an early book like The Mother-Daughter Plot, Narrative, Psychoanalysis, Feminism, to a more recent venture such as Women Mobilizing Memory, a 2019 collection that grew out of a multi-year transnational collaboration with scholars and artists and activists from Turkey, Chile, the US, and elsewhere. In addition to feminist studies, Mariana's major contributions over the past couple of decades have been to the fields of Holocaust studies, memory studies, and the study of visual culture, not least photography. Indeed, the generative nature of her work has transformed all of those fields simultaneously, a remarkable achievement. Among the works that traverse this terrain are two that she co-authored uh, with the historian Leo Spitzer, who is also here today and who I also consider a dear friend. Uh, those two remarkable books are Ghosts of Home, The Afterlives of Chernovitz in Jewish Memory, and the recent School Pictures in Liquid Time, Reframing Difference. As many in the audience will already know, Mariana's most generative and transformative concept has been post-memory a concept she has elaborated in numerous essays and two instantly classic books, Family Frames, Photography, Narrative, and Post-Memory, and The Generation of Post-Memory, Writing and Visual Culture After the Holocaust. 
In Mariana's terms, post-memory describes the relationship that the generation after those who witnessed cultural or collective trauma bears to the experience of those who came before. Experiences transmitted so deeply and affectively as to seem to constitute memories in their own right. When I say that the concept of post-memory has been generative, I mean that it, is both, it has both named a very specific phenomena, the intergenerational transmission of trauma of the Holocaust from survivors to their children, and has proved portable across different histories and even across uh, different, uh, and even across additional generations, as well as to non-familial witnesses who embrace what Mariana calls affiliative post-memory. Grounded in her own autobiographical experiences as daughter of survivors, and in her reading of works of Holocaust literature, such as Art Spiegelman's Mouse, Mariana's concept also possesses what I would call an intrinsic generosity. It emerges from experiences beyond her own story, and it provides a vocabulary for those with different experiences to describe their own histories. When I teach Mariana's work, as I do every year, and there are people here who can attest to that, I always love to quote the passage in the generation of post-memory where she describes the origins of her concept, which derives not only from her reading of Mouse, but also from having heard Toni Morrison read from Beloved. As Mariana writes, Beloved dramatized the haunting transgenerational reach of trauma and showed me that latency need not mean forgetting or oblivion. Generations after slavery, Morrison was able to convey its impacts and effects more powerfully than contemporary accounts. How is tra trauma transmitted across generations, I began to wonder. How is it remembered by those who did not live it or know it in their own bodies? This is the story of Denver in the novel, and as it is the story of Spiegelman's Artie. In some ways, she writes, it is my story as well. Um, the striking ability that this passage illustrates of combining the personal and the literary, with the ethical and the political, captures what I love about Mariana's work and what I think will be its lasting achievement. I'm very much looking forward to this afternoon's lecture, which is titled Remembering Possibility, Memory, and Photography in Liquid Time. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Mariana Hirsch. I'm so moved and humbled to be here. First of all, um, in this gathering, being in person with all of you and resuming, hopefully resuming, um, the kind of circle community of intellectual and personal exchange and friendship and conversation that we've been having on a flat screen um, with all of us hovering um, you know, behind our, our um, videos and microphones. Uh, so that's, that's really moving. Um, I really want to thank the Levy Center and Sarah and Michael and uh, Chelsea White for making all this possible and inviting me uh, for this uh, occasion and for this talk, which was several years in the making, and uh, for your patience in waiting so that we could gather in person to talk. It's also, um, you know, a, a, a really, terrible moment, you know, it's not only where we reflect on two years of losses of so many kinds, as Sarah mentioned, um, but also uh, a war raging uh, that we're witnessing from afar, some of us maybe from not so afar because we have personal ties to the region where this is happening. So it's very difficult to talk about anything but that right now, uh, and uh, I, I will try to bring it in to my talk. Um, so thank you, and I'll, I'll um, as long as the slides are working, I'll just forge right in and talk about remembering possibility, which is a challenge right now. It's hard to think about possibility when we're all so down. So I'm going to try to reflect on how we can, act, in fact, keep possibility in mind, even in the wake of and in the face of traumatic histories. And this is really uh, trying to engage with memory studies um, at, in our our moment. In his landmark book, Marking Time in a Culture of Amnesia, Andreas Hussen explains the obsession with memory in the past that marked the end of the last century. 
by invoking teleological views of history and what he termed the crisis of the ideology of progress, universalism, and modernization. So here's some things that well, when we lost faith in progress, we turned to the past and we, we became obsessed with the past. For some time, this turn to the past uh, provided a means to critique and to enlarge the present, to contest official histories, to make space for suppressed or forgotten voices that might enlarge the historical archive. Can everybody hear me? Am I yeah. speaking into the mic? Thanks. Like many of us in this room, I came into the field of memory studies precisely to embrace this critical potential. Um, drawing on family memories of surviving the Holocaust in Europe, as Michael mentioned, I focused in my work over the last couple of decades on the trauma it occasioned among victims and survivors on, and on its fraud transmission across generation, um, a process I discuss as post memory. Now, one of the tenets of memory studies, and I think we've all internalized it at this point, is that memory is always fundamentally in the present. We don't recall the past, but we create the past we need now, we need in our present. At the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st, that present is shadowed by the aftermath of traumatic histories that haunt it and demand to be worked through. And of course, also by present day crises that have felt like forms of traumatic return, continuing wars, genocides, refugee crises, state sanctioned violence, pandemics, and so much more. This conception of time as a form of traumatic return and of memory as recursive has in large part displaced the linearity of progress and futurity to be sure, but it has also come with its own problematic implications. So rather than conceptualizing cultural memory through the lens of traumatic return, more recently, scholars and practitioners of memory have highlighted something else, practices of vulnerability, of care, of healing, of repair. This course is that without denying the magnitude of traumatic loss, also resist its unforgiving return and its um, inevitable, inevitable return. My own work, as Michael mentioned, with feminist, queer, and decolonial approaches to time and memory, uh, approaches that are marked by commitments to social justice, have prompted such, such questioning or such a displacement of trauma and its inexorable after effects. Instead, I've been searching for alternative, multiple nonlinear temporalities that can make visible acts of resistance, of refusal, and unlearning, and that make space for remembering possibility. So it's on such a practice of unlearning and unmaking that I'd like to draw today by turning to a medium, photography, that I found particularly useful in my thinking about time and memory. Michael mentioned the recent book that Leo Spitzer and I published um, just before the pandemic started on photography and photo-based memory art that has allowed us to think about how to access some of these multiple potential potentialities of memory. So specifically in this uh, recent book on school photos, we have tried to theorize a notion of liquid time that I'd like to develop further in this talk. And I'd like to um, explore the connection of memory and liquid time by way of two photo-based art projects that um, approach photography and liquid time in radically different ways and I hope you will help me think about how they do that. So these are two projects um, on your left. <laughs> um, the inkjet print and drawing, Mendel Grossman, The Witness, as well as the artist book that I haven't pictured here, Bearing Witness, by the Argentinian artist, Mirta Kupfermeng. And on your right, the recent artist book, Mischling One, and an exhibition, My Name is Sarah, by the British photographer Sarah Davidman, which, um, came, which she produced between 2019 and 2021. So let me now talk about, um, a little bit about photography and time. And um, trying to talk about photography 
right now or about anything. Um, and having looked for some examples of just images that I could show as I discuss photography from a more theoretical perspective, I really had to turn from Im to images from Ukraine. I really could not not show these. And I'm sorry because they are really painful and I promise not to show too many of them. But this one was particularly striking to me. So you might ask, um, in thinking about photography and time, well, I mean, in thinking about um, memory and time, why would I turn to photography in particular? It might seem counterintuitive that a still photograph would be open to multiple temporalities and possibilities. We think of still photography as capturing one moment in time, right? But I'm gonna try to convince you that um, this is a generative way to talk about, uh, about temporality and memory. In his book, Camera Lucida, La Chambre Claire, Paul Barth famously wrote that the photograph does not call out the past. Not only is the photograph never in essence a memory, but it actually blocks memory, quite quickly becomes a counter memory. And it does so, he argues, through its power to occlude other forms of recollection. And yet for Bart, photography performs the inexorable passage of time. And I quote him, by giving me the absolute past of the post, ARS, he writes, the photograph tells me death in the future. Indeed, Bach seems, sees time itself as a photographic punctum that confronts what he terms that this will be and that this has been, the Saha Ete. Photographic time is thus both sequential, the record of singular moments that are irrevocably past, and recursive, evolving um, in haunting returns and after effects. These powerful, what he calls emanations from the past in the photograph that Bart discusses through his notion of the punctum that sears us when we see it. And I think I saw that response in you also when you saw those two photos that were found in the rubble in, in Kiev. Um, these powerful emanations open a way to see time's effective dimensions powerfully available in photographs as forms of nostalgic, melancholic memory. And yet what's surprising to me is that Bart, for Bart, the photograph itself remains the same. It's static, it's unaltered, it's unalterable. What changes is its effect on us, our response to it, what it brings forth from the past. But I wonder, is the photograph itself now also contingent and thus malleable? If it is, then it would allow us to re-envision the history from which it emerges and to discover within it different contingencies and uh, potentialities. Walter Benjamin's notion of the optical unconscious presents photography precisely in this contingent way. Benjamin is concerned with the invisible that's present within the visible and with the camera's ability to bring this to visibility minute um, elements of the photograph scene. The camera, he writes, introduces us to unconscious optics as the psychoanalysis to unconscious impulses. It's an interesting um, analogy that you know, bears a lot of conversation. The camera, he thinks, can reveal what we see without realizing it, just as psychoanalysis can uncover what we know without knowing that we know it, what is stored in our unconscious. The optical unconscious disturbs and expands conscious acts of looking and the smooth surfaces of photographic images. As images circulate, their unconscious does as well. What happens, for example, if we bring back the different looks and gazes that were present at the photographic event, but that are excluded from an image shaped by a singular gaze? In this way, we can look at the image not only from the perspective of the photographer, who controls the lens and the shutter, or the institution that sponsors the photographic event, but also through the perspective of the photographed persons at the time of the event, and by them and their descendants or correspondents or people who read the newspaper later at different moments of retrospection. I mean, in this case, we could think about the parents who you know, who posed, posed, you know, helped those children pose. We could think about why that, what, what, what was happening in that event. And you can see that the scene becomes, the event becomes much more capacious and larger. Multiplying these perspectives 
enhances the image's heterogeneity and allows us to enter it from different vantage points. By unsettling the power and authority of the photographer over the image, a multiplicity of meanings can emerge from the encounter of different subjects at the time of the image's making and also subsequently, of course. We might thus argue that the photograph anticipates a future viewer who will see in it what we could not detect at the time of its making. And this is my favorite quote from Benjamin of all time. As Benjamin writes, no matter how artful the photographer, no matter how carefully posed his subject, the beholder feels an irresistible urge to search such a picture for this tiny spark of contingency of the here and now with which reality has, so to speak, seared the subject, to find the innocuous spot where the immediacy of that long forgotten moment the future in the immediacy, the future nests so eloquently that we, looking back, might discover it. And you see the complicated temporality that Benjamin evokes here in relation to the photograph. More recent analyses of the different dimensions of photography by theorists and by photo-based artists also point to potentialities contained in the image that can be made visible in the different temporalities in which the photograph lives and the diff different kind of memory it carries and elicits. The photography theorist Ariela Aisha Azulay, for example, urges us to see photography not through the images themselves, but through the events that occasion them. A photographic event might or might not result in an image, but it organizes our field of vision into what is to be made visible, clear, and recognizable on the one hand, and what is not considered worth framing and extracting as an image on the other. The camera's shutter, in Azulai's view, extracts the image from the surrounding time space, reflecting the mechanisms of power that organize our social and political lives. In a split second, she writes, the camera's shutter draws three dividing lines, in time, between before and after, in space, between who and or what is in front of the camera and who or what is behind it, and in the body politic, between those who possess and operate such devices and appropriate and accumulate their product and those whose countenance, resources, and labor are extracted. The shutter's click is controlled by the single point perspective of the individual photographer who possesses the power to frame the image and to fix the photograph person or scene into the domain of the visible. For Azulai, therefore, the shutter is a, what she terms a synecdoche for the operation of the imperial enterprise altogether. It separates time punctually into a sequence of events, events that are captured to organize a view of history and the makeup of historical archives. In analog photography, this view of the shutter as the instrument that secures the image and helps constitute the archive must really be enlarged to take into account the processing, the liquid processing, essential to photographic developing and printing, a procedure open to contingency and manipulability or malleability. And when uh, Leo Spitzer and I began to work on, um, on our book about school picture, pictures of children, we found particularly um, inspiring a very short essay by the photographer Jeff Wall, who talks about, who, and the essay is called Photography and Liquid Intelligence. Wall bases his reflections about the liquid intelligence of the analog photograph precisely on this darkroom process in which both photographic film and the photosensitive paper onto which its image is subsequently projected are immersed in a liquid developing solution. There, each can change. I don't know how many here have experiences with working in a dark room. You know, you put this thing into the liquid and there, there's a weight, there's a, there's a weight, you know, it takes time. And during that time, you just wonder what will emerge, you know, what will. So, um, each can change often in subtle and unexpected ways before becoming then chemically fixed, again through an immersion in liquid and to perpetuity. When he wrote the essay in the late 1980s, Jeff Wall wanted to mark the beginnings of the digital turn that introduced a different, different technological and temporal photo processing regime from its analog antecedent. 
one affecting, he argued, a new displacement of water in photography. But Wall also wanted to complicate the pervasive view of photography as an inexorable apparatus and tool of ideological power and domination, a medium of representation in which, when fixed into permanence, um, embodies a dry and thus unalterable optical and technological intelligence. Instead, in highlighting the liquid intelligence of the photograph, he reveals the fluid connection of the photograph to nature and to water, the contingencies, the possibilities, the potentials, the effective registers inherent in the process of image making. So in what um, we wanted, therefore, to think of as liquid time, photographs continue developing, as it were, when they are viewed and reviewed by people in different periods and in different presence. Unfixed, they remain open, active, dynamic, acquiring new meanings in new circumstances or returning to potential meanings they contained before they were immersed in the fixing solution. So of course we're, we're seeing this idea of the liquidity of the analog processing, both literally, but also metaphorically thinking about the malleability of the photograph in this metaphorical way. But of course in digital photography, um, digital photography, which is not dependent on the exposure and fixing of its images on immersion in liquid, could also be regarded as fluid, potentially changeable, contingent and dynamic, both technically and then also metaphorically. I don't know how many people have seen this photograph yesterday. It became Im immediately iconic. And of course it's a photograph about photographs and it's a photograph about death and um, really when you look at the three portraits that this of his wife and two children that this man is holding, we can really begin to see the event of that portraiture in a very different way, the way it looks to us now, retrospectively, right? So, such a, everybody knows what this is a picture of, the mother and children were killed on that bridge. And uh, Lindsay Adaria, who is an amazing photojournalist from the New York Times, um, took this picture and it's been in many, many papers um, when the story has be immediately become iconic and we might think about iconicity um, in this way as well. So, it, it, you know, I think the temporality of these images is so complicated, right? Um, it's uh, that, and, and, you know, I would suggest that a fluid and, and multi-temporal reading of the photograph can displace the retrospective gaze shattered by a known and predetermined outcome that have dominated critical approaches to images of past violence, displacement, war, and genocide, as well as the canon of memory studies. And it inspires us to think further back to the event and to the time before the shutter click that extracted the image. If we only look at these three people through what happened, aren't we robbing them of the time that they lived when that, the, those portraits were taken. So this is, this is the way we've, we've tried to think about the photographs. But how would this kind of rewinding alter the image and enlarge its temporalities even further? Might it mini mitigate the inevitable return of trauma as well? Hard to think about in response to this image, but I wanted us to be challenged by it. So in the, our book on school photos and its accompanying exhibition, uh, Leo and I wanted to affiliate with the school children um, who were looking at the camera when their school photos were taken. And we might think of these three people also looking at the portrait photographer, not with the shutter that fixes them into civil subjects. We attempted to break both from the institutional and the retrospective gaze and the unforgiving temporality of disaster. We wanted to interrupt the linear histories and teleologies that photos represent in order to leave space for, again, what Ariela Azulay has called potential history. Not just what was, but what might have been and what might potentially be. We argue that family, school, portrait photograph photographs show us not only the past in which they were taken, but the present and the futures contained in that past. Futures that their diverse subjects may have envisioned when they stood facing the lens. Breaking out of entrenched memories and returns of traumatic pasts, 
we sought to recuperate the resistances, the hopes, the dreams that also shaped these images. Hopes and dreams that were destroyed in the violent histories that coincided with the development of photography as a medium. The two works that I want to turn to now uh, place archival images of Jewish subjects during the Second World War back into liquid time in order to unfix them. And yet doing so, um, I want to show, does not necessarily mean that they could also undo their teleologies, that they could free their subjects from the capture of the shutter and the fixing fluid, as well as from the power of the single point perspective. These two projects um, I want to show take very different approaches to the ironies of backshadowing retrospection and also to the possibility of retrospective repair. Um, so let me begin with the work of Mirta Kupferme. Um, this is a classic etching of hers called En Camino. Um, Kupferme is the daughter of Holocaust survivors from Hungary and Czechoslovakia. She was born and raised in the country of their refuge, Argentina, during periods of its own authoritarian repression and economic crises. Her work as a printmaker, photographer, video and installation artist is devoted to, but not entirely weighted down by these histories and their vicissitudes. So she's a, mainly a printmaker, but has much more recently turned to a number of photo-based projects. And it is one of these that I want to, one of these that I want to turn to now. In her photo-based projects, Kupferming shares the challenges of other contemporary artists who engage with archival photographs from the period of the Holocaust. The sources and attributions of thousands of photos that have survived the destruction are often ambiguous, and many are miscategorized in various public and private archives around the globe. Paradoxically, however, and no doubt owing to the relative ubiquity of these images, contemporary Jewish artists working on projects memorializing the victims have often had to resort to photographs taken by perpetrators. Um, but Kupferming, in both her 2019 inkjet print and drawing, Mendel Grossman, The Witness, and in her 2020 artist book, Bearing Witness, that I'm going to show you in a moment, contest this practice by highlighting the courageous clandestine acts of witness by the Jewish ghetto photographer Mendel Grossman and by implication of other clandestine ghetto photographers as well. Kupferming's print and artist book are tributes to photography as a technology of political resistance. She uses digital techniques to zoom in, to reset, to transform ghetto photographs, reversing the gazes and frames of a history that's in large part survived in the viewfinders and archives of the perpetrators. And indeed, the source image on which she bases her um, work, which is a little hard to read and I'm going to decode it for you, um, is this image. Um, it's um, a photograph taken by Walter Genewein, a high-ranking Nazi official who, through what I have termed a, a Nazi gaze, took over 600 35 millimeter color slides of the activities of Jews in the Wuch ghetto between 1940 and 1944. A skilled amateur photographer, Genevine had access to high grade cameras and to scarce Ige Farben Akfa color stock and processing. His many ethnographic images of ghetto inhabitants, and this is taken from Kupferming artist book, not from his own slides, um, and their vulnerable lives do what perpetrators' images frequently do. They stage Jews as abject, inferior species on the eve of their extinction. And yet, Genevan's ghetto images do contain many small gestures of resistance on the part and refusal on the part of their subjects. The slide that prompted Kupferming's project shows a group of young Jewish school children, each wearing a Nazi-mandated yellow star, waiting for food in front of an unidentified building in Wuch, in all likelihood their school. Originally captioned Schulausspeisung, school feeding, by him, the photograph was taken in 1941, 
during the brief months when Nazi authorities still permitted some non-vocational schooling in the ghetto. Soon after this photo was taken, the Nazis began to deport which ghetto Jews whom they deemed as unfit workers, in their, uh, the ones who were unfit to work in their war effort, to nearby Helmno, where nearly all, um, and certainly many or most of the children in this photograph, were murdered in, in gas vans. Schulausspeisung, like many of Ginevan's images, is staged to present the ghetto to outsiders as a benign community that feeds and educates its children. To Nazi indoctrinated viewers, however, these hungry children no doubt appeared as supplicants on a brief reprieve from their intended destruction. And to contemporary viewers, this image in Bart's terms tells us death in the future. The photo is taken from, a, from an angle, and the children are looking expectantly off to the left, squinting into the sun. Still, the large group is pretty disorderly, with a few children looking elsewhere than at the camera, and only very few are smiling. But three boys in the front, the one with the striped sweater and the ones around him, actually stare back directly and without smiling at the photographer. In their apparent non-compliance with the role assigned to them, I would say they silently subvert the photographer's monolithic gaze and take at least some command of the photographic event. The children's heterogeneous looks and expressions in this photo they led us to wonder what they actually saw when they looked into Genevine's camera lens. And this is something we discussed with the artist Mirta Kupferming because we were planning an exhibition on school photos, which was on view at Dartmouth College Hood Museum of Art. And uh, we, the question we discussed is, what do we think the children were looking at when they were looking at this Nazi official in a uniform um, pointing a lens at them? And this became the challenge that uh, produced this work. Um, in this work, Mirta Kupferming aligns herself with the children as they face the camera lens, and she animates their presence to reconceive their experience of the photographic event. And she, what she does is to digitally create an alternative, an alternate scenario to undo the power and the teleology of Genevine's slide. She, she refrains, she does not show us the photographer, and she does not show us directly the photo that he took, which I've just shown you, right? She does not want to display it. What she does is to reverse his gaze and grant the children their own point of view. She represents Genevan himself only as that cold, static lens situated above the children and focused on them. But in that lens's reflection, um, the Nazi photographer's look is returned by multiple eyes. Using Photoshop on her digitally re-photographed version of Genevine's original, she builds on the stare of the three non-compliant children in the front row. Um, but more than that, in a fleeting, barely visible, discernible reflection that she added to the image in Genevine's lens, we can now see the outline of an additional person an adult. This is Mendel Grossman, the Jewish photographer and in Kupferming's construction clandestine witness to this photographic event. So she imagines him taking a picture of Geneva, right? So Geneva then becomes his, um, his object. Now who is Mendel Grossman? Many of you certainly know about him. He was employed as an official photographer to publicize the activities of the Wuch Ghetto by the Jewish Council and he seek, had secretly secured a small camera for his own use. He pilfered and hid um, film stock and, um, from his official duties and daringly took and then buried hundreds of surreptitious images, many taken through the buttonhole um, of his coat with a crack in a door, in order to ensure that a fuller visual record of a population slated for destruction would have the possibility to survive. In Kupferming's imagined scenario, Rosman stands behind the children and secretly photographs the photographer Genevine. Capturing Genevine's lens and its reflection um, in the, the image that Kupferming constructed, Rosman offers the children a frame through which they can look back at the Nazi photographer, making him the object of their gaze. All the while, Grossman, 
as clandestine witness, remains outside the frame and on a different plane. He's unseen and thus he remains free. He's floating there. He's not in the frame. Through this act of creative repair, Kupferming has given Roseman and the children some amount of control of the visual field. She's altered that image. And on the surface of this layered, digitally created work, Kupferming herself graphically inscribes the story of Mendel Roseman his, and his courageous acts in the ghetto in her own handwriting. She writes that Quote, the texture of the graphic handwriting produces a veil that paradoxically unveils Mendel's hidden way of taking photos. While writing, she writes, I felt like a scribe who copies by hand a millinery text on the scrolls of a Torah. So placing her text on the projection of a shadow, Kupferming touches Grossman from a great distance and by way of her direct touch, brings him closer to us. So let me just briefly talk about this artist book that she created, um, which is characterized by the same kind of digital creation and manual inscription. To view this work, she invites us to open a box in which it's contained to unhook a clasp in the shape of a camera lens. She gives us white gloves with which to touch it, um, to, so to ask us to turn the pages carefully through these actions, she engages us as viewers in our, our hands, our senses, in a haptic encounter. And the book is completely organized around Grossman's lens. We look at it through veils of translucent pages. We look at it from the side, it looks back at us. We see it in, uh, in, again in the digital construction as though it were um, hidden in his coat. We're every, in every way implicated in the book's many visual fields. And at the end of the book, we see ourselves in a mirror inserted into the last page. We view photograph of Grossman photographing, taken by other ghetto photographers, and we see some of the photographs he took um, of ghetto life, mostly clandestinely. It's really a beautiful book. He's there in image and shadow, a persistent, determined witness to degradation and deportation. And as we turn the pages, Pao Lam's words, inscribed as the artist book's epigram, affect us profoundly. We bear witness for the witness. Ptelan wrote, who will bear witness for the witness? We come to bear witness for the witness. And through our visual and haptic engagement with her intriguing multidimensional artistic creation, we also bear witness to Kupferming's own act of witness. Uh, which, I mean, she documents in handwritten notes that testify to, to the extensive research she did about Woods and Grossman. At the center of her book is, again, this, a fold-out version of her remake of the Genevain Schulauspeisung image. Uh, it's larger than the other pages. It requires unfolding and smoothing out on our part, inviting our bodily and haptic participation in this remake. We fold it, we unfold it, and thus fold it into our own time. We bring the children along as well, reimagining their future, not through Genevan's shutter, but through Grossman's lens instead. The large inject print is smaller here, embedded into a context, included in a book that can be in our home and on our table. Bearing Witness highlights the subversive work of Grossman's witnessing lens, whether open or shut, hidden or exposed, that lens, seen here from multiple angles, revealing multiple scenes, becomes a persistent witness to this ghetto and to the history of destruction and survival that we have come to think of as the Holocaust. In our own encounter with it, we participate in his act of witness in our own present. Using the potentials of photography, this is a gift from the future for those who were captured in images of impending disaster. Rewinding, unmaking, unfixing these photographs from the archives of catastrophe, Kupferming infuses them with renewed possibility. She thus shows us ways in which in liquid time, painful legacies can be transformed into works of beauty and acts of repair. I want to turn now to my second artist, who is going to qualify some of these conclusions and approach these archives in I think a different way. Now this is um, the, a project uh, by British photographer Sarah Davidman, 
her artist book, Mischling One, and then her accompanying exhibit, My Name is Sarah. Davidman is the daughter of a German Jew who came to the UK on the kinder transport as a child. Her mother is British, not Jewish, and thus according to Nuremberg laws, had she lived in Germany, she would have been a Mischling Ersten Grades, she would have been a Mischling One. Um, she was named Sarah, the name that was added to the identity cards of all her Jewish women relatives during the Nazi period to mark them as slated for separation and annihilation. Along with her name, she carries their stories, and as we shall see, the heavy psychic and bodily legacies of persecution um, and annihilation, she carries their blood. Can art practices help us work through and transmit these legacies? Davidman's work, work asks, and I think her responses are different from Kupfer Mink's. I've been thinking about the quite radical ways in which this project encounters the archives of the past for several months now. I hope this discussion can help me with the many questions that it's raised for me. In previous work, I don't know if you know this project, it's really wonderful. David Mann engaged the relationship of photography and time, as well as the possibility of repair, in very compelling ways. Especially relevant is her project, Ken, to be destroyed, where she altered, and one could say repaired, the family photos of her transgender uncle, Ken, after receiving a package of documents and photographs from her mother labeled Ken to be destroyed. It was a manila folder, and it was labeled Ken to be destroyed. Well, she didn't destroy them. Um, she revised them, she remade them, and in her digital versions, Ken becomes the second bride in their wedding photo, rather than the groom, and goes on to have a life in which he openly, rather than secretly, was able to dress as a woman. Engaging queer lives and their temporalities, David Mann reconfigures the teleology of domestic photography through a process of unmaking and remaking of destruction and creation. She treats these archival images irreverently. She infuses them with new life, and thus she remakes the past. She grants Ken the life that they wish they had been able to have, and erasing shame and secrecy, she infuses that life with beauty and with joy. In this more recent project on which she's been working for quite a while, Davidman tackles family histories and suggests the ways in which photos from the past, either preceding or during genocidal violence, need first to be destroyed if they can ever be repaired. Mischling One and the exhibit, My Name is Sarah, are based on the history of David, David Mann's Berlin family and their fate during the Nazi period. The book and the exhibit juxtapose family photos from before that were drawn from a family album that she inherited from her aunt Susie with family trees, transport documents, documents detailing Nazi racial laws. I don't have images of all the different dimensions of this work, but I have the book, and later maybe you would want to come and look at it. Um, putting these diverse yet deeply interconnected archival documents together, David then tries to understand how Jewish lives were impacted by exclusionary and genocidal racial laws, and how this legal system affects her in the second generation. Based on extensive family archival and legal research and an intense desire to feel and to transmit the visceral effects of the deadly system into which her family, to which her family was subject, David then mobilizes an array of photographic techniques to engage with the archives of pre-Nazi German Jewish lives and their destruction. Engaging with them for David then means to reprocess and represent them in what I would suggest is liquid time. So let me just give you a sense of the range of images that comprise this project. There are beautiful images like this one, pages reproducing pre-war family and school photos printed on handwritten text that might have been written on the verso side or on postcards also marked with handwriting. In addition, there are chilling documents, beautifully reproduced documents of racial laws, transport lists, letters of appeal, letters from the International Tracing Service dryly reporting the failed searches for surviving family members. And then there's a whole other range of images. I hope you can see this. 
um, heavily manipulated and intervened archival photos, digital negatives that are reprocessed as tintype, tintypes and as chemigrams. The latter are made with the artist's own blood, darkroom materials, and bleach. Okay? How, I wonder, are we to interpret this literal understanding of blood as a dimension of Nazi racialization and persecution, and Sarah Davidman's literal adoption and performance of the categorization of the Mischling. To consider blood more deeply, Davidman made these beautiful microscopic images and prints of her own blood mixed with that of other surviving members of this Berlin Jewish family. She has said that these are meant to signal their survival and continuity in the face of the genocidal machinery of death. What does this gesture mean? How are we to read it? Besides blood, and I'm sorry I don't have an image of this, she also uses her own hair in some of the prints, a plate that had been cut in her childhood with which she creates photograms, using the hair as a tribute to the Jewish women whose hair was cut or shaved in the camps and used by the Nazis. Even as she darkens, scratches, marks, unmakes, and remakes pre-war images of daily life in tintypes and chemograms, the artist donates her own blood and hair to make new images of recognition, tribute, and survival. We could think of this embodied performance as a way to enter the history, to feel it viscerally, to find a form through which to transmit its profound and wide-ranging transgenerational effects. So I'm wondering, is it a gesture like Art Spiegelman's, the literalization of Hitler's characterization of Jews as vermin, is, is that, or the adoption of the term queer, right, um, for example. But doesn't take, um, taking racialization through blood, literally, and making its representation so beautiful, also risk perpetuating a persistent biological view of race? What are the limits of critique, this work um, asks. I'm wondering about this work. In a later dimension of the project, entitled Remains, Davidman begins burning digital copies of the original photos and photographing and filming the process of their slow consumption by fire. And in the exhibition, remaining fragments of the burned photos are hung in mobiles like this one, some of them with rocks, with stones, marking the you know, visit of graves. So there's a video that describes this project the best, but I think to do something different here to show you this brief video. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna stop and let you see it for a minute. And, uh, whoops. No, it's, it's going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Um, and I'll talk while you watch, okay? I should be the same Vimeo. So, you know, what we do by watching her work is move from looking at the reproduction of images and handwriting that's left intact to witnessing the scratched out chemogram, the burning of photos. It's wrenching, mm -hmm. to me anyway. What does it mean to take the meaning of Holocaust as burnt offering so literally? Does the act of burning photos and reducing them or their digital facsimiles to ashes risk dangerously evoking frightening associations to the burning of bodies? If, like Nota Kupferming, Sarah Davidsman's project is also to alter images, it's not to repair, but it's to destroy them. Not the originals, of course, but for us watching them burn, I think has a powerful effect of witnessing um, an act of destruction uh, of archives that we're used to treat with reverence. Remember I showed you how Kupferman gives us glo white gloves to look at these images and, um, in their, in their um, preciousness, right? Um, so what's, what's Davidman doing? 
think the destructive aspect of her work is part of the act of witnessing destruction transgenerationally, it's, she seems to say. When people are violently destroyed, are not their earlier images also somehow marked by that later fate? Can we look back at a pre-war moment without allowing our knowledge of what has come, what was to come circumscribe our vision? Davidman would suggest not, and she suggests that the photographic medium itself, by showing us only normal, normalcy and ordinariness, is implicated in obscuring the devastation that ensued. And yet, the images are not completely destroyed not even the burnt ones. Inevitably, as you can see here, at each image something indestructible remains. A look, a smile, a gesture. Like the blood that marks continuity, the images also continue to live even as they burn, or rather they live again. What do these remnants announce or enable, I wonder? How do they qualify our ideas about the liquid time of possibility? Thinking about this, I was reminded of the poet Paul Celan's famous passage about the German language after Hitler. What remains, he asks, him, he asks, for a poet writing in German in the language of the murderers after the Holocaust? And I wanted to quote from Celan as we watch this burning. Reachable, near and lost, he writes, there remained in the midst of all the losses this one thing, language but it had to pass through its own answerlessness, pass through frightful muting, pass through the thousand darknesses of death-bringing speech, pass through and came to light again, enriched by all this. So what remains of images marked by violence and loss? What remains of a medium that records so much destruction? Maybe like language, photography also has to go through a thousand darknesses through its own obscurity before it can begin to signify again. And maybe new potential meanings have to begin with such literal forms of signification, blood, hair, burnt offering. Maybe that's a place to begin and then move on from there. Like Meta Kupferming, Davidman also rewinds, she unmakes, she unfixes photographs from the archives of catastrophe. She also shows us ways in which, in liquid time, painful legacies can be transformed into works of beauty. But even as she destroys images from the past, does she do what Benjamin suggested? Does she find this tiny spark of contingency that is in those photos? Can she retrieve, in Benjamin's terms, that long forgotten moment in which the future nests so eloquently that we, looking back, may rediscover it. So this is the question that remains for me, and I hope you'll help me think about it. Thank you. Turn the lights up. Thank you um, so much. That was really kind of amazing. And yeah, I think we'll do this. Um, that was really amazing. And you know, as you always do, you introduce us to incredible works of art that are so provocative and uh, raise so many questions as you, as, as you yourself just did. Um, and you have this amazing ability also to, um, to inject the present right into our, you know, into, a, into a talk that you've obviously been working on for a long time. And I really, uh, I don't know how you do that, um, though I understand the impulse, obviously. Um, we have some time for, for questions and discussion, so the floor is open. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I've never, I, I was not familiar at all with uh, David and Richard Kupferman. Of course I am mostly from your own work. Mm -hmm. um, the David Min is really kind of mind blowing. Um, this use of blood and fire and everything. I'm still trying to also understand that and think about it. Um, yeah, I see it. I see a way. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. An attempt at ownership? Is it. I, you know, I'm, I'm spitting. Yeah. Obviously. But is it. 
I'm part of it. I had some ownership. I don't know, Marianne, but thank you. I'm, I'm going to spend all night. I don't sleep, it's your problem. <laughs> Ownership, yeah. I mean, I think that um, she really wants to, sort of, you know, enter the images somehow. Um, and you know, I, I, as I said, I have a lot of questions about it. Is it appropriative? Is it, you know, too literal? But then, you know, and and I was actually sort of started out being, you know, I'm, she had asked me to write a blurb for her book and you know to write about the project that she could post on her website and. I just really had to think about it, and um, so I came out in this other place where I felt like there is possibility of this, and that maybe you need to destroy before you can even think about rebuilding. And we're seeing so much destruction right now that mm -hmm. I don't know if I would advocate destruction. So anyway, I have a lot of questions about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Can you exactly. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much um, for, for speaking. I think you had a beautiful, beautiful presentation. I, there's so much in, in healing where you go back and you see the photos being altered. Do you see there also being a way where you tell the tragedy and you tell the background of what's happened and the healing when they go back and alter the photography, some of the artists in and we tell the story so it can be a given way. Do you also see other artists that perhaps don't have that background that change the story and perhaps turn it into an, a, an existence of the Holocaust didn't happen or make it something? It's a, a denial. Well, you know, where there's a lot of leeway to change. I mean, I, I think your question is a good one because it's raised by this uh, opening that you know I gave with uh, yes we can change the we can change the pictures and therefore we can change the past right um, so I, I think your question is a question of evidence and how much freedom do you have to change the evidence and uh, you know that um, there's been a, a, a really tremendous progression in our thinking about that if you think of a book like Art Spiegelman's Mouse well what did he do I mean he started drawing Jews as mice and Germans as cats. I mean, he could not have done that in the 50s, you know, right? I mean, there's a kind of reverence that turns into a reverence that actually now produces a greater understanding, but at a certain moment that becomes possible. If we're looking at, you know, the pictures of people murdered in Ukraine right now, you cannot imagine that somebody would draw a comic of it, right? It's just unimaginable. But at some point, that too will happen, right? And there will be fiction films about it that uh, you know, that create individual stories. So we're, and, and you know, in my writing about Post Memory, I've sort of set up the second generation as the gatekeepers that um, draw the line somewhere and say, this is appropriate and this is not appropriate. In the later, in the third generation and so on, it becomes more, um, you know, more possible, more possible. We can't control this, these processes. We can't even control the information that's circulating today, right? These pictures, that um, are circulating from the press in Ukraine, people in Russia think are digitally constructed. So, I mean, there, these media give us a lot of freedom. But I do feel that through fictionalization and through these changes, there's a lot, there's a lot that we can learn by inserting ourselves into the stories of the past and trying to understand them in new ways. So I would not, um, I don't have a problem with some of the irreverence that some of these artists show. I don't think that we need to treat every document from, you know, a painful past with, um, you know, with a, a certain kind of reverence because then we we can't really find the connections necessarily. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, with every single case, I know when it's not appropriate from my perspective, <laughs> right? Uh, you just when some, when you start cringing, you know, there's something that happened, but that may not be everyone's perspective. So, you know, films like Schindler's List, like Life is Beautiful, I mean, people have a lot of trouble with these various kinds of fictionalization. And I don't see this as different from that. Sure. Thank you so much for this incredibly fascinating talk. Um, my first question is about the role of desire in these two works, how you see that differently. And then my second question is about witnessing, um, how, 
witness differently when Cooperman's works is in a book, for example, versus when her work is seen um, here on the screen or at an exhibition? So the different media of display. Mm -hmm. um, well, so your first question was about desire. That's a great question. And it is something that, for me, characterizes the investment in subsequent generations in, the, in, 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 in different histories. I mean, that's, um, you know, Stephen Greenblatt talked about talk, speaking with the dead, right, and the new historicism. This is what we, we, we want to kind of be back in the time. And, and, but memory studies has shown us that we're not there. You know, we're really, it's really about the present. We're here, and we cannot do that. But we're constantly shuttling between these two approaches. And um, these are, for, for Sarah David, and these are personal family photographs. For Kupferman, it's really an archival image that's a perpetrator photo. Um, and she can't leave it there. She cannot leave those children in this slide made by this Nazi official. She has to somehow um, take them out of that situation, out of that event, and create a different event for them. So that's a desire to repair, I would say. Um, it's profoundly reparative. It's profoundly generous and generative, to use your terms. Um, and, uh, and it just takes a tremendous amount of work to do that, because the research she had to do, she learned all about Grossman, about Woods. When he says not stuff, she knows she's not a historian. But it, it takes the, an investment from many different things. So that's the desire. The desire is to fix something in the past and to create a different past. Um, in Sarah Davidman, it's also it's about a desire to really understand the profound um, um, implication of her family and these laws. And I, I can pass this book around. I have to say that you know she destroys and this this beautiful book. Um, had coffee spilled on it, so um, <laughs> it's, it's no longer what it was. But you can get a sense of the, the different images. Um, so yes, desire is really important, but um, what we desire, right, is um, you know subjective often, but also generational, I would say. It seems like the Ken project, though, is so much closer to Kupfernick, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, that's a that, totally repairing. Yeah, that's clearly yeah. Mm -hmm. interesting. And you know, that's how I first got to know her work. I mean, it's uh, but also because um, you know she was the daughter of a kindred transport, so the Ken project is her mother's family. But she was always very involved in her, and in fact, she and Jack Elberstein worked together on the kindred transport. Um, so you know, there's a whole other project that I think remains there and. Uh, has to do with her father's uh, very, very serious problems with depression and anxiety um, as a result of having been a child in the kinder transport. So a lot of that, what she's seeing is that, but it's also, I mean, I wanted to show the Ken project because unlike Bertha Bifferman, she's, um, you know, she's a queer artist who does not have children who will not have children. So this, none of this is getting passed down biologically, which I think is kind of interesting in relation to the to her use of blood, right? Um, because there's no continuity, no, no generational continuity for her. I mean, I think your question about display is really interesting because I'm so taken with these artist books that are very rare, I mean, especially Cooper Mix is in a limited edition and libraries have to purchase it and, and so on, um, or, or um, galleries. Um, and it's very hard for a lot of people to look at an artist book except slides, right? Um, so it's a, it, you know, it's a very intimate kind of project. Uh, and I do think we experience these things very differently. These are not, you know, major artists that would be seen by a lot of different people. I mean, yes, there were some reviews of you know, hyperallergic reviews, <coughs> Sarah Davidman's book very favorably, and there's been some, a lot of press about, uh, in Britain about the exhibition, because it's so striking. But, you know, these are not you know, major artists. So one of the things that I like doing is to bring some of these artists to visibility because I think their work is so interesting. So maybe you have some thoughts about um, these I mean, I'm blown about. away um, <laughs> by both of the artists and from what you said. Yeah, I, I, I feel like um, there's almost this desire in 
Um, David's in, in her work and her embodiment through that to um, to memorialize the pain, and so the desire is almost to yeah to bring to light that pain. Mm -hmm. And inhabit it in some way. Yeah. The inhabitant or something. And also make us cringe, right? Yeah. 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 The things we do, right? The yeah. I was thinking about the future possibility, though, and that's maybe still in those photos, um, but I, I don't know about if there's future possibilities of them. Well, I think when you think you have to destroy before you rebuild, you have to kind of sit with the destruction and then see, see what else emerges. And that's very hard because I've been, Leo and I, when we, you know, we're, we're very set on this idea that you have to look at the future of the past and you have to grant people you know, who are standing in front of that lens their moment and that, that moment of their present and the future they were looking to. And you know, those three people in Ukraine, and, you, know, you have to grant them that moment. You can't only look at them retrospectively. But David Mann actually does say, you can't just do that. So I'm, I'm having a big kind of crisis because I've been, you know, this has been our argument. And now, looking at this work, I'm beginning to rethink it. I thought of also uh, Dominic of Capra and his, his argument that you know, in order to work through, you also have to act out. That's There's right. a lot of acting out going on in this project. That's, right. that's a good, mm -hmm. that's very good analogy. Um, Sarah had a question. I do. Um, uh, thank you so much. I, I have a question that relates to the cringy, the cringeness. Um, I was doing some research just pre-pandemic on a, a family photo, a Sephardic family photo album um, held by the daughter of the photographer who is in her 80s, and she is an artist. Um, and she was taking the original photographs, the only extant, and reproducing them, you know, transforming them into art. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested that these artists are not altering originals. In both cases, they are altering reproductions. And indeed, the um, Cooperman seems to have a kind of archival evocation with the white gloves, mm -hmm. um, inviting the viewer to only open the book with white gloves. So I was curious if you had come across artists who are actually repurposing the, or, the extant original only photographs of their own histories or of the histories of others? That's such a great question. I can't think offhand, but I'm, I'm going to have to think about that because I was very struck by, I watched the, the talk that Davidman gave um, when her book came out, and she made clear to say, you know, these are digital reproductions, but I saved the ashes. So I'm, I'm trying to think like, you know, what is that, right? Um, but she she does not reprocess. To burn an original would be, that would be, how would we feel about that? We would really not approve, right? I mean, we'd be very, very, much more upset. We're already upset, but we would be much more upset. Um, but I mean, what does this artist do with, with her um, She. Um, rather complex to explain, but she creates art around the photograph, essentially, mm -hmm. that um, is both of her own vision, but also is honors um, the work of her father, who was the photographer, mm -hmm. who, who worked in healing arts. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's very hard to not treat archival photos, especially of people who haven't survived or, you know, were threatened destruction, to not treat them with some amount of reverence or respect. On the other hand, as we saw with the first picture from Ukraine I showed you, a lot of photos become orphaned. I mean, photos survive the you know, people who were killed, and then they become orphaned. And my work on photography actually started with such a story, because um, when I, I wrote my book, um, The Mother-Daughter Plot, I, on the cover, I put a photograph of my grandmother and aunt that was taken before World War One. My aunt was much, much older than my mother. She was a little girl. And it was a studio portrait, and it was beautiful. It's beautiful, so I 
uh, I used it as on the cover of my book, and I sent uh, the, the book to, to a cousin of mine who lives in Vienna, and she was immediately called me and said, oh, that's so interesting. I had a lot of pictures of this woman, who turns out to be your grandmother, but I didn't know who she was, and we were cleaning house and my husband just threw it away, and I just could not believe that that would have happened and that there were pictures of my grandmother that you know, I had known about, and I just felt this profound sense of loss. Um, but this happens all the time. So then I started thinking about family photos and why do we invest them with such, in, you know, with so much desire and, and value and worth. Um, but uh, this, of course, happens all the time. You go to any flea market and you find people's uh, photographs. Um, and so, I mean, but still there's something that we feel is very precious about. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about repair and the different modalities of repair that you're working with. So, and certainly, reparation or reparative reading has been a part of feminist and queer studies, um, which is a little different than say, economic or political call for reparations. Um, I'm curious if there, yeah, what genealogies of repair you're working with, if there is something distinct when it comes to photography and repair. I mean, I'm struck by the way some of the language around reparative reading can be found in the Benjamin little history of photography mm -hmm. quote. So just would love to hear you this again. Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> um, Eve Sedgwick's essay, you know, tremendously, was just tremendously um, helpful to me because it is about, you know, not backshadowing, right? And leaving open possibilities. So a lot of the language, you know, it's an old essay, but it continues to reverberate in my thinking. And, um, and reparative reading is, um, you know, is sort of, I think, what I, I do. Um, also, reparation from the political angle because a, a lot of this work has to do with, um, you know, some of the teaching I've done. Also with Leo, and we we taught a course called the Voice of the Witness, where there was a whole unit on uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and you know, the sort of reparation being very much part of ways of, of responding and dealing with the past. Um, from uh, you know, from transitional justice uh, perspectives, which I think is also reverberates in here. But recently, and especially in the project that I'm working on now, the Zip Code Memory Project that I spoke about yesterday, a little bit, I'm thinking of repair as mending. You know, in this very um, modest way of like darning a sock. You know, and it will never be. You know, it's not about reconstituting something that was before. But just thinking of repair in this very um, tactile and also modest way because it's pretty much, you know, I feel like, I hate to say it, I mean, the world's pretty broken and uh, if we're going to start repairing, it's going to have to be locally and in these very small ways. There's no sense that there will be like a reparation program in which we can repair, you know, the history of slavery in this country. But that doesn't mean we don't have to do it. Right? So, uh, and you know, Mark Sanders in writing about the DRC in South Africa had this wonderful line about uh, there, there must be reparation, there can never be reparation in this kind of aporia, deconstructive way of thinking about it. And, 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 and he keeps repeating that line, there must be reparation, there can never be reparation. And that's sort of how I think about it um, also. So can you repair the past? Of course not. but. Looking, you know, granting those people some form of life and possibility in their own present seems like a small way to honor some element of the past of, and of those past lives um, that we don't want to take away from them. So, thank you for the question because I hadn't really thought about it that way. I think that's maybe a really kind of beautiful place to end for the moment. Um, it's been great to be here live and in person with you and with all of you. Thank you all for coming and being part of this.